The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Welcome to Getting to Know You. My name is Joe Nash. Today we're talking to former Assemblyman Jack McEnany. He's retired now. You may know him besides his work as an Assemblyman. He's the author of this book, A History of Albany. He's known as a historian. Um, and he worked for the U.S. Census. He went to the um, John F. Kennedy School of Government. He was in the Peace Corps. And I think, if I remember, because you were here, we talked to you before, you had something to do with the New York State Archives? I can't remember. I was that. on the Archives Board for a, a number of years for the State Archives. I'm still on the Capitol Commission. Oh, that's right, the Capitol. Yeah. Okay. So you've always been involved um, in his historical things, and he's known as a speaker and talking about history. So today we're going to be talking about Irish history in Albany and the Capitol District. And two days ago, we just were telling me, um, you had an event at the um, CDIAA. I already forgot what it was, but tell me about that organization in the um, the Famine Garden that down there. And you also honored um, William Kennedy, our esteemed Albany yeah. writer. So and we should mention, since we're in, in Colony, that uh, uh, both uh, Bill Kennedy and I are Siena College graduates. Oh, that's right. Graduates. That's right. As well, he's in the English major. I'm the history major. Okay. Though. Well, you, you guys weren't there to get. No, you, had, you wouldn't have been there together. No, because you already told me. Yeah, the same high school, <laughs> to CBA. So, uh, but he's uh, achieved a great deal more uh, fame over the years, and uh, very deservedly so. Now, um, once a year at the Hibernian Center, which houses a number of Irish groups, uh, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the Ladies uh, Ancient Order of Hibernians, but also the Capital District Irish American. Oh. American okay. Cultural Club. And that's right down on Ontario. So. Right on, on Ontario st uh, Street. Old timers will remember when it was the Knights of Columbus <laughs> Hall. And they still meet there on, on occasion, as do a number of uh, step dancing groups and, uh, and uh, people with, with different interests, cultural interests. And uh, there was this wonderful woman that worked for us for years as a volunteer. And her name was Rosemary O'Brien. And when the uh, commemoration, the 150th anniversary of the beginning of the Irish famine began, she worked very hard to uh, raise money and get volunteers and put in a, a memorial garden in front of the Hibernian Center, which is called the Famine Garden. And there's a huge uh, uh, granite uh, uh, classic uh, uh, Celtic cross, and it's in memory of those people who didn't make it in the Irish famine, which is one of the worst disasters to occur, certainly the worst in Ireland, but one of the worst in the world, uh, as well as uh, uh, allow people to memorialize their own Irish roots with memorial bricks, something we're doing here in the Colony yeah, Library. Yeah, for yeah. The, uh, we have a story garden going yeah, in, or we have a templative garden. And it's, it's a nice way for people to memorialize either forebears or sometimes each other. It's, it's, a, it's a good way to do things. Well, once a year, we honor uh, Rosemary's memory. She's passed on within the last couple of years. But we also honor a prominent member of the uh, uh, Irish American community. Uh, last year, it was Ed Collins, who was a president of the uh, Irish American Heritage Museum, which is now down on Broadway. And this year, we wanted to honor uh, Bill Kennedy, because Kennedy's uh, nine novels and numerous other works really have uh, have shown off Albany and its people in a very unique way. It's not just the, the high society or the uh, prominent politicos, but it's also average people at every level. And a lot of them were Irish. Irish a lot of them were Irish. He also uses a, a genealogy from the Phelan family and the, the names that will show up in one uh, in one novel, uh, Doherty or Quinn will show up, and it'll be the uh, the grandson yeah. in, a, in a later one, and, and so on. Well, before we talk specifically about the famine and why people came, is it true that I was I came across this? I was doing a little research here. By the 1880s, 
almost half of Albany were of Irish descent. Is that true? Or? No, it wouldn't have been that high. But by 1855, which is uh, Albany's, the most common religion in Albany was Roman Catholic, and the vast majority of them were Irish, the rest were uh, primarily German. And that was a sea change from what had existed, say, in 1840. Okay. And it was the, the famine immigrants who came in such numbers, uh, overwhelming resources to some extent, uh, that really changed those numbers. Now, were there, people, were there Irish here before the 1840s, oh, before the famine? They go back to 1654. Oh, okay, they did come in there. Okay. And uh, there's also what's called the Scotch-Irish myth that all of those people that fought with Washington's army and so on and so forth uh, are really Ulster Scots uh, okay. who call themselves Scotch-Irish. There's actually a number of uh, prominent uh, Irish who would call themselves nothing but, like General Sullivan and so on and so well, forth. One thing I've come across in reading about Ireland, they don't just say that the immigrants, um, people immigrated or people left. A lot of the, the word I keep seeing used several times is they were escaping. I mean, besides the fan of what? Yeah, I think there's a big difference, and it goes in not just uh, Irish history, but it goes in Eastern European, Jewish, yeah. or Sicilian, or anything else. We have two kinds of people come here, and one is a true immigrant, and a true immigrant uh, saves up their money, uh, looks what, to where they're going, writes letters, tries to secure housing and a job in advance, and just the same as we would do if we were moving to another country. That immigrant makes a very conscious choice and does it on their own time. A refugee is somebody entirely different. Uh, the Syrians, for example, that are going into Europe now are going there out of desperation. And they don't have the time for the niceties. To so do research on where to go. <laughs> they, they want to, quote, get the hell out, yeah, yeah, yeah. save the family, save your life, go someplace, go any place. And uh, I think the historical memory of where you came from is different for the person who's forced out than it is oh, okay. for the person who very consciously chooses to leave. Okay. And th there's a, an immigrant's longing for the old life. We, uh, I always compare um, you know, the famine refugees with uh, Tevia and all the yeah. uh, wonderful <laughs> uh, Jewish characters in Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, yeah. You know, they didn't want to leave that beloved little yeah. Anna Tevia, the little village. They had to. They had yeah. no choice. It was, uh, and and I think there's always a longing for tradition. Maybe sometimes uh, colored. Uh, artificially about how things were really wonderful there, but we were forced to leave, and a lot of nostalgia goes into that. Okay. So in the 1840s, the famine everyone has heard of, how, from your research and reading, how, how bad actually was it? I mean, It was horrendous. Uh, the population of Ireland, which had grown enormously in the early 1800s, the population of Ireland was officially 8.1 million. But 51% of those people spoke Irish as a first language and were very hostile to uh, British overlords. So there were a number of them who didn't cooperate, tried to avoid the census. So we know that's higher. Mm -hmm. We know the birth rate was higher than that. So by the time you got to August of 1845, which is the first failure of the potato crop, you probably had a nation that was nearly 9 million people. By 1900, that whole island of Ireland had about three million people. And during the famine itself, we always hear about, you know, a black 47 and 1848. That's, a, that's very misleading, because the famine starts in the fall, the late summer and the fall of 45. It's not over until 1852. Right, so and, and, and that's when the birth rate finally exceeds the death rate. So for seven years, this, this country is absolutely scourged with famine conditions. One million people die outright connected to the famine. They die either from outright starvation or they die from famine-related oh, diseases, okay. which, of course, weakened people are subject to. Another two million leave, and they, they go to Great Britain. 
They show up in Glasgow, Scotland, in Liverpool, these Irish names for the Beatles, mm. <laughs> Irish politicians that show up in, in uh, British news, even in the parliament. A lot of these are the same as I would be or Bill Kennedy or uh, other people, descendants of famine immigrants. And of course, the goal for so many of them was to come to the United States so, and get out from under the Union Jack. So the, all these millions of people that came over, were they just trying to get anywhere, or was, was Albany a actual specific um, destination for some? I think it was a little easier for the ones that came to Albany because of the Erie Canal. Uh -huh. We had a core of successful Irish who had already built the canal. They build came the with the canal. Okay. They helped build the railroads. We had the first working railroad mm -hmm. in the country here. Uh, people that made uh, fortunes from warehousing, from distilling, from brewing. From uh, They were starting to move up a little bit in politics at that time. And I think they were there to welcome these people when they were uh, overwhelmed. But these people, we had an Irish regiment in the War of 1812. Oh, okay. And uh, a fellow who ran for sheriff afterwards, Mahar and didn't quite make it, but you had an established Irish hierarchy here. And that was a good, that was a good indication that this might be a, a place of now, opportunity. At that time, did New York and Boston have oh, established yeah. Irish? Uh, they did, okay. uh, but because they were ports, they were really overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh, actually, everybody was overwhelmed. And also, remember I mentioned that 50 percent of the, the country uh, spoke Irish as a first mm -hmm. language. Many of them spoke it, probably most of them, as an only language. Okay. So their skills were very rudimentary uh, agricultural skills for the most part. Uh, most could not read or write. Uh, there was extraordinary uh, discrimination against them in their home country, which meant uh, very limited opportunities. So when they came, uh, there was tremendous resentment. Some of the resentment was more understandable than just a nativist bigotry. They brought with them diseases, particularly ship's fever, which was typhus. Uh, in Albany, New York, and Bill Kennedy mentioned this in, in his reading from Quinn's book, uh, people were very upset because the Irish brought the diseases, and in the month of August particularly, they would throw stones at canal boats uh, coming down into Albany County. People were herded on to detention camps in uh, the island of Green Island, uh, oh, really? north side, uh, up where Washington Park yeah, is. And yeah. is it, you know, don't come downtown till the summer is over because we worry about contagion. Okay. But even so, um, would it have been easier for an immigrant in Albany to find work and get established than in a bigger city? I, I think there was opportunity because of the canal and the railroad, okay. so to some extent it was. But of course, supply and demand, you can imagine what the pay is when you have <laughs> 20 people looking for you know, two jobs. And then after the famine, um, I, the Irish, the, the immigration continued past 1850s. It, stead it steadily continued. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the numbers, like the first Irish uh, mayor doesn't get there till uh, 1880. In Troy, it's 1875. Okay. So they, they don't rise to the top. I think what gave respectability to the Irish, because you had a, a major nativist uh, movement, which was anti-German, anti-Catholic, anti-Irish, anti-immigrant in general. It was the order of the Star Spangled Banner who were pledged to say, I know nothing if they're asked about it. And it became a political party that controlled the state of Massachusetts at one point and a and couple of other would have states. Been? 1850s. But wouldn't a lot of those people have been descendants of immigrants? No. Not they not of not of Catholic oh, immigrants, okay, okay. not of German immigrants, not okay. of uh, <laughs> Irish Catholics and so on. And it's a uh, um, you remember when uh, George H.W. Bush and Clinton ran the first time, and uh, Ross Perot had a third party, mm -hmm. and he got about 20 million votes, which is essentially the yes. reason why uh, the incumbent president, Bush, lost. And the statement was, the second largest vote for a third party candidate since the 1850s. What were they talking about? The Know Nothing oh, Party. Okay. That was That's how powerful this third party was. 
and they made life miserable. That's when the no Irish need apply mm -hmm. signs uh, came out and existed for a good 50 or 60 and how, years after. Um, from your reading of history and study, the anti-Catholicism, um, anti was that obviously was that a big uh... it was it was probably bigger in Troy than in Albany okay. uh, but in Albany you had a know nothing party who was running a candidate for mayor and endorsing him and different candidates and so on so they were for a secret society once they turned into a party they were definitely out of the closet well I'm from Troy and yeah. I, there's an awful lot of Catholic churches um, unfortunately many have closed but there was a, obviously there must have been a breakthrough eventually that well in the, if, if we're going to talk about uh, Catholicism in both Albany and Troy uh, something happened that was very positive and was famine related uh, Albany before the famine had three churches that were English speaking, one that was German. And there was no cathedral. And in 1847, the diocese, the Archdiocese of New York, which was the whole state of New York, was broken up into uh, Bishop Timon was sent out to uh, Western New York for uh, Buffalo and somewhere in the middle of the state that split. And then Bishop John McCluskey, first American born priest, first New York state born priest. He was born in Brooklyn and his parents were from Ireland, he was made the Bishop of Albany. Oh, okay. And he, this is all he had in Albany. He had St. Peter's up in, uh, uh, up in uh, 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 Troy and St. Patrick's and what's now Water Valide. There wasn't a lot there. And he had to build churches, but he also had to build orphanages. And if you look at the dates of orphanages, like 1854 mm -hmm. is uh, LaSalle uh, School oh, okay. for Boys. Yeah. Uh, that's a cholera year. Oh, okay. We're producing orphans like they're going out of styles and half orphans because you lose the mother, the father has to go out and work. Child goes to the orphanage and they visit on weekends. And a lot of the orphans were half orphans. Mm -hmm. And the, these, these institutions, look at the founding, look at Albany Home for Children for that matter, which was originally known as the Albany Protestant Orphan Asylum. That's founded, I think, around 1829. It's another cholera year. Oh, so these okay. epidemics caused all kinds of social needs. Also, the, the era is a very uh, materialistic uh, Victorian age. So if you build a, a church, it has to be very respectable. Mm -hmm. uh, people are judging you uh, by your, your appearances. And, and uh, McCluskey has to build a cathedral in the middle of a of a famine and that cathedral that's down there now which is the third oldest in the United States to be built as a cathedral of any denomination uh, that cathedral that's down there land had to be cleared by volunteer labor this is the way you did business they hired Patrick Keeley from Brooklyn who would leave his plans behind use your volunteer labor would use local materials and labor when he finally had to hire skilled people and they built a cathedral. They had to move out of downtown. Land was too expensive, so it's over on Cathedral Hill, which is where okay. the, the governor's mansion is today, and never really completed it until a generation yeah. later. They put up with one tower instead of two and so on. But uh, the church did some incredible things, and that was the rallying point. It was not uncommon for a, 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 an immigrant uh, to go to the United States and say, I'm, I'm going to Albany. Well, where are you going to be? I have no idea where I'm going to be. And they would simply write to, uh, you know, uh, Patrick Murphy, care of Catholic Church, Albany, New York, because sooner or later he's going yeah. to show up there. <laughs> and they also started, and this is the era, of course, before the government had any services, the, the, the Catholic... Um, Charities, Catholic social services were pretty, were pretty big yes. too. They, yeah. they started all these with in the hospitals. And education, and too, education. because if you, if you went to the public school system, the chances were very good that the teachers, one, they, they would teach out of the King James Bible, sort of a fine point of difference mm. to us, but they would also proselytize to make good Americans out of these kids, which meant good Protestant Americans. And so the Catholic school system was set up at that time to ensure that the culture and the religion could continue. So 
all you've been saying about the Irish, you could say about other immigrant groups. Oh yeah, they built, we built America, and all this. Yep. So what, uh, you know, today immigration's in the news a lot. What, you, you think are there some lessons, or are people forgetting? I, I think are people so. forgetting the lessons of the past. It, it's the, it's a part of the um, curriculum, New York State education curriculum, that somewhere for at least an hour, somewhere in the course of your education, people will be told about the famine. You go online; it's a wonderful. Uh, uh, choice. You're a science teacher. You can understand the problem with having only one type yeah. of potato. <laughs> that when that fails, it all fails, and this is what the poor eat. Uh, you can do it from a political point of view. How can the wealthiest empire in the world allow its people to starve figuratively in the shadow of its capital in London? Um, there's different ways to look at it, and I debated that when I was an assemblyman. It was a two-hour debate, and the argument was, why, why are we teaching European history? They can get that in college. Why are we teaching European history in New York public schools? And the reason you did is because it changed forever the demographics of New York State. There's a totally different makeup of people because of being overwhelmed by these people. And I remember saying at the time, is it important? I don't know. Is Ronald Reagan important to America? Is John F. Kennedy important? Eugene O'Neill? F. Scott Fitzgerald? Locally, you know, Bill Kennedy? Mm -hmm. Myself, if you want. Are these people, do they have any influence? And Margaret Mitchell, uh, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell with the, you know, gone with the wind. Yes, yes. Right? These are all the descendants of famine immigrants. And they're all marked, often scarred, by that memory. You know, the average famine immigrant lived seven years, just seven years. When, they, they, got, when they got over here. They, they, their health was yeah. shot. Psychologically, we know about uh, post-traumatic stress. Mm. Uh, people didn't recognize it, but can you imagine if you leave your old and your weak behind so that you can escape? Imagine the survivor's guilt. Yeah. And then you get the lowest job, you cram people into housing that was made for one or two families. It's not unusual to find 10 families. And you come to those conditions, you don't last very long. Now, is it a good deal for the great-grandparents, or great-grandchildren, and uh, you know the uh, grandchildren? Yes, and we produce writers and scholars and college presidents. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a great history of triumph there and of contribution to America. Then let's move forward. We now have major controversy that people who are different from us, they don't look the same, they don't speak the English language, direct parallel, they're not the same religion as the mainstream. You know, if we let them in, what's going to happen? We're going to lose everything. Well, we let the Irish in. <laughs> and they were looked on as, as very foreign. They, they were actually looked on as a different race. You know, Thomas Nast with his yeah. monkey-faced Irishman cartoons, they referred to them as a race, that they were unique and they would undermine American values. It didn't happen. Oh, yeah. And in fact, the country is the richer for it. And it's hard when you're going through it. And we start talking about bringing people in or of the Muslim faith who are essentially refugees rather than immigrants. And if you look forward, the history of all of these groups who were not welcome, Italians, Jews, these people were not welcome, uh, many of them when they came here and suffered in some cases terrible discrimination and terrible economic conditions. And yet, fast forward, you know, we can see the lesson mm. three generations later. So the well, country why, is the richer for it. So why do you think today people aren't seeing that? They're not. They don't realize that the people that are coming in now will eventually help build the country. I, I think it's when you're scared, and when people make yeah. you scared, and you're nervous. It's hard to look at the big picture. Yeah. It's hard to look at the course of history and the the people that we we brought in and actually assimilated, often on their own terms. Uh, and they've wound up to be some of our best Americans. The Irish hold uh, have the highest percentage, and I think the highest numbers of uh, medals of honor, for example. Okay. We started to say, when I think the Irish began to get respectability uh, after this panic period was with the Civil War. Okay. And the Civil War 
prove that people really would go and defend the country and would bleed on the battlefields of Virginia and so on. And I think the begr begrudgingly a great deal of respect was given, not by everybody, yeah, but, I think but all by the, the mainstream. I think all immigrant groups, they all go through yeah. that period, right? The, I, think, I, think, I think Italians made it. Uh, more with their performance in World War II. Oh, yeah. you remember World War I, Italy started out uh, on the wrong side, and, and uh, same thing with World War II. Will these people go? They'll, you know, will they ever go and, and fight for the United States? And you know, We have Peter D'Alessandro with the, the Medal of Honor and other Italian names who just really exhibited themselves as courageous and loyal Americans and begrudgingly I think a lot of people yeah. who looked at these people as foreign there's also another reason why people in the 20th century were very worried about uh, immigrants it's the steamship era and they're always afraid they're going to marry your daughter and move <laughs> back to wherever you know 40 percent of all Greeks and 30 percent of all Italians Hungarians and Poles they exercised the American dream, the same one that you and I would have if we went broke and we were young. Move off to wherever, Venezuela, whatever, make a lot of money, work hard, go back to the home village, marry the prettiest girl, buy the biggest house. That's the American dream. And actually, a good third in the steamship era, when you're a week away in seven, instead of seven or nine weeks away by sail in a much safer journey, a lot of people feared that if you assimilated these newer uh, people, all they were going to do is make their money and eventually take your grandchildren and go out off to the foreign country. But I mean, ultimately, most of the Irish stayed, right? You no, know, the lowest return rate of immigrants to the United States is Eastern European Jews and Irish Catholics. They stay the most, is that They stay the most. Okay because they had nothing to return to. Okay. Well, that's what I think at the very beginning we yeah. were saying. People yeah. didn't just leave. They actually were trying to escape. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for some good insight into our history. I'm, I'm of Irish descent, so I've, I learned a few yeah. things. And we have a lot of copy of Jack's book here, The History of yeah. Albany. And you'll probably see him out speaking. You're always speaking somewhere. We're right? always speaking okay. somewhere. There's a newer book out. There. Oh, is there a new edition? Yes, with, okay. a, with, well, with, we, with an extra chapter, but it's out of print now. So Okay. We might we yeah. have about seven or eight yeah. copies. Yeah, we might one, have it. This might be, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the one with Len Tantillo. Okay. Return of the Experiment. It's a more of a white well, color. That's, we, well, that's we have cool. six or seven copies of your book here, so I'm sure I think that one is down there. So thanks once again for coming. Um, we'll probably have you again next time or sometime in the future. And Good to be here, John. Okay. And we'll see you next time on Getting to Know You.